Hello everyone, and welcome back to History 1151. In our last video, we discussed life in Europe in medieval times and on the verge of the so-called Age of Discovery, and why European people would want to leave their homelands and sail across the sea to the Americas. We defined some of these reasons, referring to them as push factors and pull factors, terminology that you will see repeated throughout this course. In this video, we are going to discuss the methods of colonization taken by some of the major European powers, how their attitudes and approaches towards the conquest and settlement of the New World, and how their approaches to this colonization were defined by their national histories. While many European nations, from the late 15th century well into the 1700s, established colonies in the Americas, we will discuss only four of the largest European colonizers, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, and the Spanish. We will talk about the English approach to colonization in future videos. Let's talk about the Spanish approach to colonization first. Since they were the first European power to establish colonies in the Americas during the voyages of Christopher Columbus, discussed previously. Spain was a Catholic power and was very interested in spreading Catholic Christianity to the people of the Americas, whom they recognized were not Christians. As a matter of fact, Native Americans did not practice any religions that Europeans were familiar with, like Buddhism, Judaism, or Islam. Spanish colonizers, from the beginning of their expeditions, would try to convert Native Americans to their faith hoping to then use these converted natives as guides who would show them the wealth of the New World and who would also act as intermediaries between the settlers and other indigenous people, while also spreading the, the Christian faith. Early on, the Spanish believed that Amerindians were not necessarily inferior to themselves once they had adopted Christianity. The Spanish best practice for Native American relations was to treat Christianized natives as equals to Europeans and brothers and sisters of the faith, although this did not always occur, as we shall see later on. Non-Christian Amerindians were to be regarded as the other, enemies to be defeated in battle or enslaved on the encomiendas with the hope that Spanish military force and a threat of slavery might entice Native Americans to convert to Christianity. The Spanish believed that this kind of forceful encroachment on the New World, including the invasion of Native American civilizations and the acculturation of indigenous people, was acceptable, even permissible, because they were accomplishing this conquest in the name of Christianity and the supposedly benevolent Spanish crown. As such, Spanish colonizers recognized that it was very important to show the symbols of their power, the crucifix and the seal of the Spanish monarchy, to signal the establishment of new settlements in the Americas. Perhaps the best example of Spain's colonial model can be seen in the Spanish conquest of Mesoamerica, primarily present-day Mexico. Hernán Cortés, leader of this colonial expedition from 1519 to 1522, demonstrated many of Spain's archetypal colonial patterns. Cortes heralded himself as a representative of the Spanish monarch, in this case, Charles V, who was also the Holy Roman Emperor. Ironically, Cortes' expedition was illegal and not sanctioned by the Spanish crown, and he had to fight off colonial authorities even as he struggled against the Aztecs. The Aztec Empire was the predominant military and cultural power in Mesoamerica, and Cortes and his men made their way to the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan with the help of indigenous guides who converted to Christianity, like Malinche, or Doña Maria, as the Spanish called her. Malinche would also become a lover of Cortes as well. Along the way, the Spanish, with the help of these native interpreters slash diplomats, made alliances with other indigenous civilizations, including the Tlaxcalans, bitter enemies of the Aztecs, who were in the midst of a flower war 
with the Aztec people, a conflict in which Mesoamerican armies fought each other in order to gain human sacrificial victims. Human sacrifice was a major part of Aztec culture, and indeed the cultures of the other indigenous peoples of Mesoamerica. Their culture was also very similar to that of the Mississippian people of the North American Southeast, whom we discussed in a previous video. Both cultures constructed pyramids and had large cities with thousands of inhabitants, including slaves. These societies were very unequal, with stratified political, religious, and military classes. Scholars think that mass human sacrifice and the occasional ritual consumption of the flesh of sacrificial victims, in addition to having a religious meeting, also served as distraction intended to keep the commoners from revolting against the elite. These sacrifices were great spectacles and accompanied by feasting and celebration. Essentially, these mass sacrifices were religious holidays in which the Mesoamericans honored their gods and praised their own culture, including the valor of the warriors who captured sacrificial victims from other Mesoamerican peoples. The Aztecs believed that the blood of sacrificial victims drained from their chest cavities after their still beating hearts had been cut out, assured that their sun god, Huitzilopochtli, would make the sun rise and keep the earth from descending into eternal darkness. In some cases, being sacrificed would have been considered an honor in Aztec society, as the victims were giving their lives to save the world, although most victims probably died unwillingly, being that they were prisoners. While human sacrifice gave cohesion to Aztec society, it would also be its undoing, as the sacrifices and the wars that accompanied them led many Mesoamerican city-states to ally themselves with Cortes against the Aztecs, their common enemy. Cortes' Spanish party of conquistadors, with its indigenous auxiliaries, traveled through Mexico and reached the capital of the Aztec Empire Tenochtitlan, where they became guests of Montezuma, the Aztec ruler. Montezuma had already heard about the visitors from the sea, and he knew of their power, and probably wanted to impress Cortes in order to have him as a potential ally. Contrary to popular opinion, there is no credible evidence to indicate that the Aztecs believed that the Spanish were gods. Cortes and his men were in awe of the wealth and opulence of the Aztec capital. Situated on a network of artificial islands, Tenochtitlan had a population of over 250,000 people, making it bigger than most cities in Europe. It also boasted aqueducts that piped in fresh water, a bustling market district, public baths, and pyramids called cues in the Aztec language, Nahuatl. At these cues, the Aztec priestly castes made their human sacrifices. The Spanish detested the Aztec religious rites, comparing the indigenous religions to Islam, and they called pyramids mosques. They even referred to non-Christian Native Americans as moros, or moors, showing how Spain's reconquista affected Spanish colonialism. Partially because of this hostile attitude and other issues, the Spanish soon wore out their welcome in Tenochtitlan. They demanded too much food and gold in tribute, and they attempted to stop the sacrifices, often violently. The Spanish, once the guests of Montezuma, quickly took the king as their hostage. An angry mob gathered outside of the Spanish quarters, and Montezuma tried to pacify the crowd but was suddenly killed. Spanish sources stated that the furious crowd killed Montezuma by pelting him with stones, while later indigenous sources claimed that the Spanish actually killed him. Relations continued to deteriorate as the Spanish attacked Aztec civilians during a religious celebration. The Spanish claimed that the Aztecs were using the celebration as a feint to attack them. A feint, by the way, is a military term for a distraction. Cortes soon realized that he, his men, and his native allies would have to flee the city if they were to survive. 
They escaped the city on the night of June 30th, 1520, fleeing over a narrow causeway that connected the island city with the mainland. The Aztecs attacked Cortes and his party, killing about 400 Spaniards and about 4,000 of the native allies were killed as well, in what would later be known as El Noche Triste, the Sad Night. The Aztecs also sacrificed many of the prisoners they captured during this battle. The Aztecs continued to harass Cortes' retreating army all the way back to the coast. In 1521, Cortes and his allies, both European and indigenous, counterattacked the Aztecs, fighting their way back to Tenochtitlan. Cortes and his men, drawing on the tactics and technology of the military revolution, built siege engines and flat-bottomed boats called brigantines and used gunpowder weapons and other dynamic tactics and technology to attack the Aztec city of Tenochtitlan. While the Aztecs had a sophisticated warrior class and they were skilled in fighting pitched battles, their tactics were adapted for capturing prisoners who would then be sacrificed. Additionally, the Aztecs' leather and textile armor while light and well adapted for captive taking, offered very little protection against the Spanish troops' steel arrowheads and sword edges, or the muscle of the Spanish horses. Even though the tactics were faltering, the Aztecs continued their prisoner taking strategy and continued making sacrifices, even as the Spanish and their allies made gains against the city of Tenochtitlan. As the Aztecs grew weaker, more and more Mesoamericans joined the Spanish cause, seeing it as an opportunity to get even with the Aztecs, an old enemy. The greatest threat to the Aztecs, far more than Spanish steel or Mesoamerican revenge, was disease, namely smallpox. Smallpox, a disease caused by the variola virus, spread from cattle to humans in the old world, but Native Americans had no immunity to this disease. Some scholars estimate that between smallpox and siege-induced famine, as much as 90% of the Aztec population died before the Spanish took control of the city. Tenochtitlan finally fell on August 13, 1521. The Spanish destroyed the town, leveling the pyramids, and filled the lake in with earth, creating the foundations for Mexico City, the present-day Mexican capital. They used stone from the demolished pyramids to build a cathedral and a plaza at the center of the new city. Both of these constructions can be seen today. The Spanish would use similar tactics, the conversion of native interpreters, shock and awe military tactics through the use of gunpowder, steel, and horses, and the establishment of alliances with indigenous people, including the hostage taking of their leadership to subdue other Native American civilizations like the Tarascans of the Yucatan Peninsula in 1530 and the Incans in Peru in 1572. Disease would also play a major role in these Spanish conquests as well, greatly diminishing indigenous manpower and resistance. With the defeat of the Aztecs, the predominant military power in Central America, the Spanish began the process of colonization and integration of the region, transforming it into New Spain. The propagation of Catholicism was key to the Spanish plan of integration and colonization. Native Americans who converted, especially those from the indigenous elite classes, could become nobility in the Spanish colonial empire, with some even intermarrying with Spanish immigrants to create a new mestizo upper class. Over time though, people of Indian and mixed heritage would be regarded as beneath those born in Spain, or people of ancest Spanish ancestry born in the New World, called criollos or creoles. Keep in mind, though, that race and ethnicity were not as important to the Spanish as they would be to other colonizing powers. For the Spanish, religion and culture were more important than race. Consider these castas or caste paintings from 18th century New Spain. They show that people of indigenous heritage could be accorded elite status in new Spanish society if they adopted European lifeways, dressing and living like the Spanish and the Criollos. 
It is also worth noting that most of the Spanish colonists who migrated to the New World after the initial conquests tended to be from elite classes back in Spain. Many were Hidalgos, second and third sons of noblemen, who had no land titles or inheritance on the Iberian Peninsula, in spite of the fact that they were considered nobility. For the Hidalgos, a push factor would have been a lack of land in Spain. A pull factor would have been the abundance of land, gold, and cheap, enslaved Amerindian labor in the New World. Before leaving for the Americas, though, Hidalgos were vetted by the Spanish Inquisition to make sure they were true Catholics and not crypto, Jews, or Muslims who had faked their conversion to avoid persecution. Dominican and Franciscan clerics, including those who had worked with the notorious Spanish Inquisition, migrated to the New World to convert the native populace, furthering Spanish colonialism. Many friars learn native languages and mix elements of Catholicism and indigenous beliefs, creating what some scholars call cultural syncretism, as was done in Mexico and further to the north, in the present-day North American Southwest. Also, this was done in Florida as well. In the Southwest, instead of tearing down indigenous religious structures called kivas, Spanish missionaries set up chapels inside the kivas. They also built missions across the region, many of which are still standing today. Spanish missionaries in the southwest were fairly successful in the colonization of the region, although Spain did lose control of the southwest in 1680 during the Pueblo Revolt and would not regain reg regional hegemony again until 1692. Back in Mexico, Spanish monks worked to translate and record stories from Native American history and mythology, giving us texts like the Florentine Codex, preserving information that would have otherwise been lost in the conquest, just as monks have been doing in Europe since medieval times. Other religious clerics, however, were far less concerned with peaceful conversion or respecting Native cultures. These leaders, many of whom had been in the Inquisition, saw cultural syncretism as heresy and tried to destroy indigenous spiritual beliefs whenever they could. Mesoamerican natives of the lower classes who did not convert were forced to work on the encomienda system, farming and mining gold and silver for the Spanish. Living conditions for the encomienda slaves were terrible, but the system brought immense wealth to the Spanish empire. After the Spanish outlawed the encomienda system, New unfree labor systems, like repartimientos and haciendas, which were much more like serfdom, came about. Additionally, haciendas operate a lot like plantations further to the north in what would become the United States. These systems were created to further exploit the labor of the Spanish Empire's indigenous and mixed race underclasses. Most of the wealth produced in the Spanish colonies was transferred back to Spain on treasure galleons, where it was spent to fight wars against the Ottoman Turks and Protestant Christian powers in Europe. This approach to relations between the colonies and the metropole, or mother country, is called mercantilism. And in this arrangement, the colonies are intended to be dependent on the mother country, while also existing primarily for the purpose of enriching the metropole. It is also worth noting that Spain's mercantilist imperial model made Spanish maritime shipping, especially treasure galleons, ideal targets for pirates and privateers. State-sanctioned pirates of other colonial powers, especially Protestant ones like the English, who attacked the slow, lightly armed treasure galleons, stealing their cargoes of gold and silver. Although the encomienda system had been very profitable and a key as aspect of Spanish mercantilism, its abuse of Native Americans made this institution less popular over time, as reformists like Bartolomé de las Casas, a Catholic bishop, called for the oppressive institution's abolition 
Las Casas saw the encomiendas as a brutal obstacle that prevented the mass conversion of Amerindians. Unfortunately, in its stead, Las Casas suggested the Spanish import enslaved Africans to replace native encomienda slaves. Spanish enslavement of Amerindians officially ended in 1542, although some enslavement of Native Americans occurred illegally in subsequent years. Keep in mind that encomiendas were replaced with other unfree labor systems, as we discussed previously. Although there were some variations across the massive Spanish colonial empire, Spain generally exhibited the following patterns in its colonization. One, the Spanish justified their colonization and conquest of Native Americans by claiming that they were acting in the name of God and their monarchs. Two, the Spanish sought to integrate conquered people through the propagation of Christianity, sometimes through cultural syncretism, but other times through the destruction of indigenous belief systems. Three, the Spanish did not immigrate in large numbers to the New World, as other colonizers did, and the regions they settled in the Americas were more densely populated with Native Americans than the regions chosen by other colonizers. Because of this, the Spanish colonial authorities had to integrate conquered Native elites into their leadership, while coercing lower class indigenous people into forced labor. Four, a cultural racial line between European and Indian and Meso Mestizo people would develop over time in the Spanish colonies. Although this racial division was less defined for the Spanish than it was for other European colonial societies. This was due to the critical role that native allies played in the defeat of powers like the Aztecs, the Spanish approach to religious conversion, and the fact that the relatively few Spanish colonists came to the New World compared with other colonial powers also played a role in making Spanish society less racialized than other colonial societies. Five, Spain sought a close centralized relationship with its colonies in which settlements existed for the good of the mother country and would set as much wealth as they could, primarily in the form of gold and silver, back to Spain. Spain's strategies for the conquest of the Americas and their approach to colonialism would have a profound impact on how the Hispanophone, Spanish-speaking nations of Latin America would develop over time. We have discussed the Spanish approach to colonialism in great detail because they were the first European power to establish large permanent colonies in the Americas and because they were able to quickly turn these colonies into a large, centralized overseas empire that existed for centuries. Now, we will turn our attention to some of the other colonial powers, although most of them will be discussed in less detail, as their colonial exploits were far less extensive in the Americas, and because they often left fewer written records behind due to their lower number of colonists. Two other colonial powers that established colonies in the Americas, but in a less extensive manner, were the Dutch, i.e. the Netherlands, and Spain's western neighbor, the Portuguese. Both of these nations had fewer economic and human resources than the larger European empires like England, France, and Spain. Thus, they had to make a different approach to colonialism. This lack of resources forced these smaller powers to play to their own cultural strengths. The Portuguese have been the leaders in maritime navigation and exploration during the Age of Discovery's early years, developing new naval technologies like the hardy sail-powered caravels and carracks, which made travel on a stormy Atlantic Ocean far more realistic than it would have been using rowing-powered galleys that plied the sea lanes of the calmer Mediterranean Sea. The Portuguese were also skilled map makers, producing some of the first and most accurate maps of the West African coast and the Americas as well. In fact, the word America is a Latinized term that comes from Americo Vespucci, a Florentine map maker who worked for Portugal and traversed what is now Brazil from 1501 to 1502. Amerigo became America 
The Portuguese did not have the economic and military resources of Spain, so they used their technology, like their advanced caravels, to explore as much of the New World as they could. Then, Portuguese mapmakers, cartographers, and explorers would use their findings from the voyages to create detailed maps by which they would claim the New World, at least in the eyes of other European powers, whom they hoped would recognize the maps they made. In this way, maps were a political tool that facilitated colonialism, assigning Portuguese domain over large swaths of the New World and its people. Portugal was also interested in converting Native Americans and integrating them, often by force, into their empire, even though they did not have the same level of military and human power that the other Europeans did. Due to their lack of human resources, the Portuguese were also quicker to import African slaves to the New World to make up for their shortage of labor. To conclude, the Portuguese colonial system was similar to the Spanish approach in that both nations wanted to convert Amerindians. At the same time, the Portuguese model also stood out as different because of Portugal's limited resources, leading this country to mark out its territory with maps while also importing slaves in large numbers to serve as a colonial labor force. Although they were from a completely different part of Europe, the Low Countries, and practiced a different form of Christianity, Protestantism, there were many similarities between the Dutch and the Catholic Portuguese approach to colonization. The Dutch, like the Portuguese, were also skilled sailors, having a long-standing naval and maritime tradition. The Dutch gained naval renown during their War of Independence against Spain, as seen during the Siege of Leiden in 1574. The Dutch War of Independence against Spain was one of the many European religious wars. During the Battle of Leiden, the Dutch army, with the help of its Protestant, English, and French Huguenot allies, destroyed the dikes that kept their country from flooding. They then sailed their ships across their own flooded countryside, and using the vessels to defeat the Spanish. In the Americas, the Dutch spread their empire across the water, penetrating up the Hudson River, named after English explorer Henry Hudson, who led a Dutch expedition there in 1609. The Dutch were also traders as well, and believed in compensating Native American powers for land, rather than simply taking it by force, as much as possible. The Dutch, under Peter Shagan, purchased Manhattan Island from the Lenape Indians for about 60 guilders worth of trinkets in 1624. Contrary to popular opinion, the Lenape Indians did not pawn off their land for worthless baubles. These so-called trinkets, including glass beads and copper kettles, had tremendous spiritual meaning for Native Americans, who used these goods for religious rites. The Lenape, however, like most Native Americans in North America, did not practice land ownership and probably thought that they were simply allowing the Dutch colonists to temporarily occupy Manhattan rather than settle it perpetually. In the future, the Lenape and other Native Americans, realizing the Dutch intended to permanently possess the land, would drive harder bargains, demanding more goods in their trades, including clothing, tools, and muskets, as seen in the Dutch purchase of Staten Island in 1630. The Dutch were also skilled map makers, like the Portuguese, and would use these maps to signal their ownership of territory in the New World, at least to other Europeans. The Dutch, unlike other European colonial powers, were actually very religiously pluralistic. They were far less concerned with converting Native Americans to Christianity. Additionally, the Dutch made it a point to allow people of all Christian sects, and even Jews, to settle in their American colonies. The Dutch had to be more religiously permissive because of their limited numbers, which was a positive. On the negative side, the Dutch made up for their lack of numbers by bringing enslaved people to the New World in great numbers, much like the Portuguese as well. Also like the Portuguese, 
the Dutch would become some of Europe's most infamous and prolific slave traders. Here is a list of similarities between the Dutch and the Portuguese colonial models. The French colonial method bore similarities to the Spanish, Portuguese, and Dutch colonial models. The French were mostly Catholic, and Catholic French colonists, like the Spanish, declared that they were settling the New World in the name of God, the Catholic Church, and the divinely blessed ruler of France. The French, like the Spanish, would show crosses and sign documents to the Native Americans. In addition, the French included performative ceremonies with their symbols, like parades, when they were signaling their colonization of the Americas. The French recognized that it was important to perform these rituals, parades, possession ceremonies, alongside presenting documents and crosses to indigenous people. Of all the European nations that engaged in colonization in the Atlantic New World, the French had the largest population, double that of Spain and four times that of England. Yet the French crown, like the Spanish, did not want too many of its subjects leaving the motherland and sailing to the New World, seeing these emigres as human resources who would fight in the country's wars and till in its fields and be the next generation of French subjects in the world. The French government did not want too many of these people to leave. The Catholic Church and the Catholic French government, however, unlike Spain, did not vet the people who left for the New World in the same way that the Spanish did through the use of the Inquisition. In fact, the Spanish government hoped that its Protestant minority, the Huguenots, would leave the country and go to the Americas. Huguenots set up Protestant colonies like Fort Caroline near present-day Jacksonville, Florida in 1564. Catholic French explorers like Jacques Cartier had explored Canada in the 1530s but did not settle in the region, seeing it as too cold and foreboding. Unfortunately for the settlers of Fort Caroline, Catholic Spanish colonists from St. Augustine, established in 1565, destroyed the Protestant colony in 1569, killing most of its inhabitants, demonstrating how the European wars of religion had spilled over into the New World. Events like Henry of Navarre's conversion to Catholicism in order to become King of France in 1572 and the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre that same year destroyed the Huguenot leadership in France. French Huguenot settlement in the New World ceased as Catholic France intensified the persecution of its Protestant minority. The Huguenots became too weak to put together their own colonies. The Edict of Nantes in 1598 ended French religious civil war, but it left the Huguenots as second-class citizens in France, ending their colonial ambitions and ability to escape to the New World. Almost a century later, in 1685, the French absolute monarch Louis XIV revoked the Edict of Nantes, making Protestantism illegal, but this persecution actually spawned a new wave of French Protestant migration to the New World. In this way, for many French colonists, religious persecution in the old country was a major push factor in inspiring immigrants to leave France and come to the Americas, although the immigration patterns would change over time. Although the French were religiously intolerant in their homeland, the French colonial approach to religion and conversion was far more open and less forceful than the conversion styles taken by other colonial powers, both Catholic and Protestant. French priests who became missionaries penetrated deep into the North American interior, traveling by water up rivers and establishing missions within Native American territory. The French missionaries tried to respect the cultural beliefs of the Native Americans they were trying to convert and they had fairly successful results, 
although there were some key exceptions, of course. While early Protestant Huguenot French settlements like Fort Caroline were destroyed, French Catholic settlements established in what is now Canada, first at Port Royal in 1605 and Quebec in 1608 under Samuel de Champlain actually succeeded. Quebec would become a major base of operations for French expeditions into the North American interior, reaching as far south and west as the Great Lakes and the Ohio country and the Missouri River and the Mississippi River Delta. The French would establish major settlements in New Orleans in 1718 and St. Louis in 1764. French soldiers and traders traveled with the missionaries into the interior, establishing small settlements that were based on the pursuit of wild game and trading with Native Americans. The French colonies, being based on trade, did not require large labor forces. Thus, the French did not really enslave Native Americans in the same way that other European, especially Spanish powers, did. The French colonies in North America would also not heavily rely on slave labor until the 18th century, as the settlements of New Orleans and St. Louis became larger. On the whole, Native American powers got along fairly well with the French colonists because they came in small numbers and were comparatively respectful of Native American life ways to the point that many French settlers and missionaries to contemporary observers had begun to live more like Indians than Europeans. Native American leaders recognized that the French were critical trading partners Native American traders sold beaver pelts to the French colonists, and the French colonists in turn sold Native Americans copper kettles, glassware, dyed wool cloth, and firearms. Beaver pelts were to the French empire what gold and silver was to the Spanish. Beaver pelts were a value, valuable commodity in northern European winters. The imported fur pelts could be made into hats and coats to help people survive the cold of Europe. Over time, the goods that the French sold their Indian trading partners, including firearms, became ensconced in Native American culture, especially religious rites. Male French settlers also married Native American women and produced mixed race children in these marriages. The offspring of these unions, called Métis, combined the life ways of their Native and European parents, creating a new culture Matee communities still exist throughout the U.S. and Canadian Midwest. In conclusion, the French method of colonization was probably the least disruptive of Native American culture and life because it was based heavily on trade, primarily of furs, and because the French kept their settlements fairly small. Because of this, French missionaries, hunters, and traders were able to penetrate deep into the interior of North America along bodies of water, reaching the Great Lakes region and other points further south and west. The French kept their colonial parties small, and their people, including the missionaries, tried to respect Native American life ways and religious beliefs, even as they tried to convert them to Christianity. The French did not want to ruin their lucrative trade opportunities by being too oppressive. The children of marriages between the French and Native Americans the Métis adopted elements of both French and Native American culture. The French approach to colonization would lead many Native American peoples to see France as an ally in conflicts against other European colonial powers. For context, the French were like the Portuguese and the Dutch in that they sent few settlers to the New World. They were like the Spanish and the Portuguese because they emphasized the conversion of Native Americans. Finally, they were like the Dutch as they used bodies of water to traverse the North American continent. Their empire was built on trade, and the French colonists, not the mother country, were pluralistic in their allowing of Protestants to come to their colonies and their respect for Native American culture and religious beliefs. The French stood out from other colonizers, however, 
in that they did not set up oppressive labor systems in North America. They did not enslave Indians, and they would not bring significant numbers of African slaves to their colonies until the 18th century, even though other colonial powers brought in enslaved people from Africa much earlier. As a side note, I should mention that I am discussing the French settlements in North America here. The French would rely heavily on slavery and other forms of unfree labor in their Caribbean colonies, but we do not have time to discuss those colonies during our course. <laughs>